Hi, I'm Brandon Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the New Mexico Humanities Council. Uh, we're here today at the International District Branch Library for the city of Albuquerque to celebrate Constitution Day 2022. We're going to be listening to and talking with a panel of three constitutional experts uh, as part of a panel that discusses the inherent tensions in the American and New Mexico constitutions. Hi, my name is Jennifer Laws and I'm a faculty member at the UNM School of Law. I work with Professor Kang, who's here on my left, and Professor Harpalani, who's in the center. Dee Dee Feldman is also joining us today. And I'm gonna offer a little bit of context as well as additional introduction for the other panelists. I'm also gonna talk about resources where you can learn more about the US and New Mexico constitutions because I am a librarian and I can't help myself. So please bear with me. Um, the, the title for today talked about inherent tensions. And this is something that I often think about when I think about the way our state and federal constitutions function. Um, but I want to say more about that because it sounds kind of negative. Um, we all learned about checks and balances, right, in high school civics class. The three constitutional branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judicial, essentially in the form of a triangle, the strongest shape in nature. There's tension built in there. I like to think of the three branches of government being engaged in an ongoing conversation, like some of our peers over here, um, in an ongoing conversation about law and policy, Dr. Layden introduced this idea when she talked about the dissents of Justice Ginsburg and the way, at times, Supreme Court justices will say directly to the legislative branch, it's time for you to change the law. We, the court, cannot do that. That's your job. And those, that conversation travels between our three branches, both at the state and federal level. Um, there are also tensions inherent in our federal system. The role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the role of the states has grown enormously since the US Constitution was signed 235 years ago on September 17th, 1787. So are the panelists here with us today are gonna to explore this theme in really diverse ways. Um, they're gonna, they, it's gonna reflect their unique perspectives, um, both academically and in terms of life experience. Okay, time to meet them. Professor John Kang, as I said, is right here on my left. He teaches constitutional law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. He writes extensively about constitutional law topics, but has really diverse approaches and perspectives that he brings to his work. His book, Oliver Wendell Holmes and the Fixations of Manliness, was published in 2018. Professor Vinay Harpalani in, this, in the center, he teaches constitutional law, civil procedure, employment discrimination, and civil rights courses at UNM School of Law. He too has diverse research interests. His work most often though, focuses on intersections between race, education, and law. So again, we're looking at topics that Dr. Layden alluded to and even talked about overtly in some of her discussion of the career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her legal work and life experiences. Um, Professor Harpalani, I do want to brag just a little. His academic articles have been cited in briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in a, a dissenting U.S. Supreme Court opinion you heard about earlier. Those dissents are important. And uh, cited by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and by the New York Court of Appeals. So just a little brag moment. Sorry, I can't help it. Dee Dee Feldman is on the end and she served, this is so amazing, she served in the New Mexico State Senate for 15 years representing the North Valley here in Albuquerque. 
She observed the interactions of our three constitutional branches of New Mexico government at a startlingly close range. <laughs> she continues her public service as an advocate for campaign finance reform, election reform, and health care reform. In 2021, she published her third book, it's here on the end of the table, called 10 More Doors. It's a political memoir about public service dedicated to change inside and outside the political system. The public library also owns copies of all three of her books. Um, and with your current and active public library card, you could place those holds today while you're here, if you'd like to. Um, it is an honor for me to be here in the company of these distinguished speakers. Before I pass the baton to Professor Kang, I do want to take a few minutes, like I said, to talk about where to get more information if you want it. So many interesting themes and topics have already been introduced here today. So you may hear some terms in Latin. You may also hear other terms related to constitutional law that are new to you. Black's Law Dictionary is one of the most authoritative sources of definitions of legal terms. This branch library owns a copy of Black's Law Dictionary. It's on the shelf, just outside the door, near the road atlases, if you want to know. It's easy to find. It can't be checked out, but it is, in our world at the law school, the first place I go when somebody's saying things in Latin that I don't know what they mean, I run over and look them up. The public library system also owns a number of books, both print and electronic, that can guide you through close reading of the United States Constitution. So a recent example, now written for young people, is a title called This Is Our Constitution by Kizer Khan. Um, it's so well written, it's really, really also appropriate for an adult audience. It's not the densest prose, though. Um, for something aimed more in that direction, you could take it a look at a title called Our Constitution, really similar, <laughs> by Donald Ritchie, or Seth Lipsky's The Citizen's Constitution. These are things that are available through the public libraries. And for a more literary take, there's a fascinating title by Garrett Epps called American Epic, Reading the US Constitution. These are places you can go to inform yourself more. Um, Professor Kang is going to talk about some of the different approaches that lawyers and judges use to interpret the text of the Constitution. Dr. Layden already introduced this idea when she was talking about her, the RBG's relationship with Aunt Justice Scalia and that they had different approaches. Um, there's a rich literature that talks about these various inter schools of interpretation and their significance for how the constitutions, both state and federal, are applied to real life situations. So I wanna give you an example. I opened the public library catalog on my computer at home last night, and I searched the phrase constitutional interpretation, not fancy, right? And it yielded multiple results, there were books. But the first entry was from something called an electronic source, Salem Press Encyclopedia, a really good article entitled Constitutional Interpretation <laughs> that had a bibliography with lots of other books that you could follow up on to read more. So your, the library offers multiple options both here and from your house. You can access quality constitutional information from any computer connected to the internet. Professor Harper Lani is going to probably do some compare and contrast or talk about the relationship between state and federal law and uh, constitutional functioning. An annotated version of the federal constitution or the, the state of New Mexico constitution is what will help you develop an even more nuanced reading of these documents. At the federal level, there is a website, it's really easy to remember, constitution.congress.gov. It is my personal favorite source of information, not just the text of the constitution, 
history, Supreme Court opinions that interpret and, and apply the articles and clauses of the Constitution. Dee Dee Feldman, because of her personal experience, is gonna talk a lot about what it looks like when the New Mexico constitutional rubber meets the road. If you want that same contextual material about the New Mexico Constitution, it is also available for free. And New Mexico is unique in this. Many states require that you pay quite a lot of money to access a fully annotated version of the state constitution, which is, in my mind, an access to justice problem. Here in New Mexico, we do not have this problem. Another simple website to remember, NM, like for New Mexico, onesource.com. This, on the start page, has a link called Constitutions, and you simply select New Mexico. They do reprint the US Constitution, just in case you need it. Um, you'll find the same contextual information, some history, some explanation of topics, and most significantly, opinions from the New Mexico Supreme Court that interpret and apply the articles and sections of our own Constitution, because the Constitution can't do all the lifting on its own. The courts have that special role of connecting it to real life circumstances. I do have a few handouts, not very many, listing some of the resources that I mentioned today. I also left one at the reference desk at the front of the library. Um, so I'm gonna ask um, Professor Kang to take the conversation now and thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attention. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate the, the kind introduction. <clears throat> First of all, I um, wanted to say how honored I am to be here today. I do a lot of speaking, but the speaking is exclusively to a group of law school students who are paying money so they can learn a skill to make more money later. So it's purely for vocational and strategic purposes that they are doing that. Uh, so it is a pleasure for me to be with the citizens of Albuquerque today to talk about a document that was made in the name of we the people. What's particularly appropriate about me talking about the Constitution to people who are not law school students, but rather the citizens of New Mexico is the fact that the US Constitution is the first Constitution in the history of the world that was written out. And the reason that it was written out, rather than just an idea, was because the framers who wrote out the Constitution wanted the common people, the people at large, to be able to read it. And although most people at the time of the founding of the Constitution could not read, the assumption is that this is not a document for lawyers. It's not a document for judges. It's a document for <coughs> we the people. So it was, it was unique in that way, it was written. It was also the first constitution, in the history of the world that was written in the name of we the people. It was an English constitution that preceded it. Entirely different idea. It was meant to limit powers, but it was not written in the name of we the English people. So it's a unique privilege to be here for me to talk with you about a document written for the citizens of the United States. So thank you for that. Um, the Constitution is pretty short if you've never read it. It only contains about 6,500 words. What the Constitution is asked to do, on the other hand, is breathtaking in nature in terms of both scope and time. It is breathtaking in the sense that the 6,500 words are tasked to do the work of creating, number one, the United <coughs> States of America from thin air. And number two, the Constitution is tasked to do the work of creating the government, limiting rights, creating government powers, and to do this forever, including after the people who wrote the Constitution are long gone. That little document of 6,500 words is about 12 single space type pages. Uh, has been given to a great deal of conflict over time regarding what it means. The biggest and most unforgettable example of that is the Civil War. I know there's a lot of reasons for why the two different sides in the United States went to war, but one side had to do, one aspect of the war had to do with the fact that there were 
competing interpretations of what the Constitution was. The South was of the view that the Constitution permitted them to secede from the Union. But the North was of the view that the states did not have the right to secede from the Union. In some ways, it was this conflict over what the Constitution meant that led to war. That's the difference between an English class and a constitutional law class. You could have a difference of interpretation regarding what Hamlet meant, but you're not gonna start a civil war as a result of it. So there's a lot at stake in getting the meaning right, and as the civil war suggests, there's always the possibility for constitutional failure. That's what makes the enterprise of the Constitution so exciting and so precarious, is that there's always a possibility for catastrophic failure. What I wanted to do today is to talk with you about what are the strategies for interpreting the Constitution. I'm not gonna go over every single strategy. I wanna respect your time. Also, I wanna hear what you have to say. So I'm going to go ahead and limit my comments. Uh, but I wanna talk about three of, the, three of the sort of foremost strategies for interpreting the Constitution. The irony is that even though the Constitution is written, there for you to read, is there for you to go on the website that Jen referred to, constitution.com, but there's so many different ways of reading it. There are techniques that are required to read the Constitution. So there has to be a debate regarding which technique we will use to interpret the Constitution before we even read the Constitution. One such technique is something called textualism. It basically means the text means what it says. Um, to give you an example of what this means, um, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law. Now, there used to be a judge on the Supreme Court named Hugo Black. He was also the person, if you did not know, who gave the speech at the inaugural of the UNM School of Law 75 years ago. We are celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. And he took a train all the way from Washington, D.C. to come to Albuquerque to offer the address. So Justice Murphy was a textualist. And for him, this phrase in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, no meant no. You can say whatever you want. I don't care. Whatever you want. The only limit for him was pretty much speech that was a clear and present danger was not permitted, but everything was okay. I don't know about you, but that makes me nervous. Um, one benefit of textualism is the fact that it provides a degree of clarity. No means no. But at the end of the day, it can't quite, it can't quite do a lot of things. It can't answer questions about, just because it's not explicitly in the Constitution, does that necessarily mean we should not recognize it? The right to marriage is not in the Constitution. Heterosexual or gay, not in there. The right to abortion is not in the Constitution explicitly. One more problem with textual, textualism is that with regard to Justice Black, he was very proud of saying that no means no, as far as he was concerned. No law can abridge the right of speech. But if you, if you asked him, speaking of rubber hitting the road, if you asked Justice Black, um, let's say, for example, selling drugs. If someone offers to sell drugs, should that be protected? Child porn, is that okay? I'm sure he would say that is not okay. So then he has to realize something other than textualism to make that argument. And there he has to refer to common sense, morality, and such as well. So those are the sort of the limits of textualism. Originalism is a second sort of technique I just want to approach on uh, just briefly. There's a school of thought that says the Constitution means what the framers said it meant back in 1787, 1789, 1791. There's that school of thought. In some ways, it's very exciting because now you have what the original intent of what the authors thought about the Constitution. There are a couple of problems with that. One problem is that the framers had different ideas. So you, they had competing ideas of what like, the First Amendment meant. Number two, sometimes they would lie in public about what they said about the Constitution. <laughs> they didn't really mean it, but they said the thing in public so they can strike a compromise with someone with whom they had a, an adversarial relationship. And it's only in their diary entries and their letters to their wives that you found out what they really thought about the Constitution. This presents significant difficulties for judges and professors because then you have to dig around their letters, dig around their letters to their wives and their, um, their non-wives that they had relations with as well. And there could be competing views given to both. 
Um, the other problem with originalism, of course, is that why do we give people who wrote the Constitution 200 years ago the opportunity to live our lives today? They were such different people. Back then, women could not vote. Back then, there was slavery. Such a different cast of characters. America was so different back then. Why give them the opportunity to tell us how we want to live? That said, there are originalists on the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas is probably the most uh, sort of outspoken originalist. And um, here's one example of originalism. Speaking of the First Amendment once more, it says that this is a different part of the First Amendment called the Establishment Clause. And the Establishment Clause says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Now, originalists would say the following. It says that Congress shall not establish religion. New Mexico can do it. Number two, establishing religion, an originalist would say, is different from financially funding it. Because back at that time, giving money to churches by the federal government was normal. So we can give money left and right to churches in the United States without establishing a formal religion of the United States of America. That's sort of the originalist interpretation of the First Amendment or one aspect of it. The last thing I want to talk about is this idea of traditions. That's another way that judges and professors interpret the Constitution. What are the traditions of the United States of America? For example, is there a tradition of recognizing gay marriage? Is there a tradition of recognizing abortion? Is there a tradition of recognizing the right of free speech on the part of corporations? In some ways, tradition is nice, but it also has its limits. What's nice about tradition is the fact that one pays a kind of uh, homage to the past while at the same time being flexible enough to interpret the Constitution to deal with today's problems. One problem with tradition is the fact that tradition is very ambiguous. Also, traditions are parallel with each other. There are like many different traditions that coexist simultaneously at, at the same time. Uh, it is curious to me, for example, that there have been people on the federal courts, constitutional law professors as well, who've suggested that there is a tradition of gay marriage and another group of people who have suggested there's a tradition of not recognizing gay marriage. My sense is that probably those traditions coexist together, so it's very difficult to parse them out. There are more different ways of interpreting the Constitution. I just want to share those three with you. Again, it is such an honor for me to share these thoughts with you today on Constitution Day. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I set up my comments here nicely. Uh, I just, uh, I'll start by kind of uh, thinking about the broad ideals of the Constitution. I think, you know, you look at the Constitution, very revered document, model for constitutions across the world. Uh, but we should also take a, a critical perspective when we're thinking about the history of the Constitution. Uh, John mentioned we the people. Uh, we know at the time of the founding uh, it really meant white men. Uh, Constitution protected slavery in many ways. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, famous abolitionist, uh, referred to the Constitution as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Uh, you all have probably heard about the three-fifths clause whereby uh, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person for representation in Congress, uh, and that advantaged the southern states uh, who had larger numbers of slaves. Uh, Three-fifths clause uh, helped protect slavery. Uh, ironically, a four-fifths clause would have been even worse because it would have given the southern states more representation. Uh, so uh, original constitution also uh, prohibited Congress from banning the importation of slaves for about uh, 20, 25 years after the founding and also had the uh, Fugitive Slave Clause, which required the return of escaped slaves. Uh, so uh, uh, Constitution started out really protecting slavery. But the you know, good thing about Constitutions is that they can change. Uh, you know, John talked about the uh, Civil War um, and uh, different interpretations of the Constitution there. But after the Civil War, we had the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, Amendment Amendments. 13th Amendment abolished slavery, uh, except as a, a <clears throat> punishment for crime. Um, so uh, 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment is also the only provision of the Constitution that applies to private actors. Uh, we need to uh, know that the Constitution is a limit on government power. Uh, it's a limit on the different uh, powers of the different branches of government, uh, and also what the government uh, can do in terms of uh, abridging the rights of people. But the 13th Amendment straight up says nobody, not a private party, not the government, no one can uh, own slaves. 
Fourteenth Amendment uh, deals with citizenship, uh, also applies due process, equal protection uh, to these states, uh, so prevents states from uh, abridging certain rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights uh, prevented the federal government uh, from abridging rights. The Fourteenth Amendment uh, is largely about the states, and it's become very important uh, in terms of just uh, protecting uh, civil rights. Fifteenth Amendment uh, guarantees that the government will not uh, abridge the right to vote. So 15th Amendment was really about the right to vote because that is really the right that is preserved of, of, of all other rights. Um, and 15th Amendment is also the only place in the Constitution where the term race is actually used. You know, we think about the Constitution, 14th Amendment protects against racial discrimination. 15th Amendment actually has uh, the terms uh, race, color, and previous condition of uh, servitude. Uh, so, and I wrote, I wrote an article that deals with race and color and, you know, why those two terms were separated out in the 15th Amendment and other places. So the Reconstruction Amendments uh, really uh, kind of changed how we look at the Constitution, really uh, adjusted the balance of power uh, between the federal government and the states. Uh, they uh, really checked state power um, after the Civil War. Uh, you know, Civil War, uh, Reconstruction Amendments, some people interpret them almost as a new uh, founding, uh, you know, new... Uh, kind of balance of power between the federal and state government. So, uh, you know, you think about just the structure of the Constitution, you have uh, federalism, this balance of power between the federal and state governments, and also separation of powers, uh, uh, division of powers between the different branches of government, the legislative branch, Congress, the executive, the president, and the judicial branch, uh, the courts. Uh, and that's another way the Constitution has kind of uh, changed over time, is that uh, the balance of power between these three branches of the government uh, has adjusted in different ways, uh, the way the courts have uh, interpreted uh, the powers of, of different branches of government. Uh, so you think about Congress, uh, you know, uh, uh, federal legislature, uh, Congress. In the Constitution, uh, Congress has uh, limited powers, right? Uh, the powers are enumerated, very specific things that Congress uh, can do. It can uh, levy taxes, it can spend money for the general welfare, Congress appropriates funding, it can also regulate interstate commerce. And the notion of interstate commerce has changed a lot over time. You, know, you think about going back to the founding versus today. Our economy has become much more national. Uh, people go across state lines uh, much more frequently. Goods, services are transported across state lines. So that has kind of increased uh, the scope of Congress's power to regulate uh, commerce, regulate uh, activities across, uh, across state lines. Uh, the courts have also, over time, uh, kind of broadened the definition of what commerce means. What exactly is commerce? Uh, originally, you may have thought of it just as the exchange of goods, uh, but there's a lot of other aspects to commerce, and uh, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is actually rooted the way, way Congress could pass that law is because of its ability to regulate interstate commerce. So Congress passed a law uh, which uh, uh, prevented even private parties from engaging in racial discrimination. The Constitution itself doesn't do that. Congress can pass a law to do that because of its power under the Commerce Clause. So you saw congressional power expand. Executive power has also expanded. Uh, as the federal government uh, you know, became more powerful after the Civil War, you see each branch, powers of each branch expanding. So the executive branch, the president, uh, you know, there's a lot of different executive departments now. Uh, the administrative state, administrative laws expanded a lot because the federal government does a lot more. If Congress is going to pass more laws, uh, well, the executive enforces the laws, right? Uh, the legislature passes laws, executive enforces laws, uh, judiciary interprets laws. So you need kind of a bigger uh, executive branch to actually enforce the laws. And, uh, you know, we have a lot more executive departments uh, today than we did at the time of the founding, a lot more executive agencies. Uh, you know, uh, president's role in uh, foreign affairs, war powers has all uh, expanded. Each branch of government, you know, likes to have more power. You know, uh, no, no, no branch of government is going to say, oh, well, we don't want power. Uh, judiciary also, the notion of judicial review goes way back to Marbury v. Madison, uh, uh, 1803. Uh, uh, Supreme Court can strike down uh, acts of Congress uh, that it deems uh, are inconsistent, violate the Constitution. Constitution doesn't actually say that, but the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Marshall, said that that's you know, part of the powers of the judiciary. And we've seen that expand over the years also as the federal government, as Congress passes more laws, you know, uh, the Supreme Court reviews uh, more laws. Um, and there's a whole notion of judicial activism uh, uh, that is critiqued 
and whether you support judicial activism or not may depend on uh, who's on the courts, right? Who's going to exercise that power. Uh, so we have the different branches of government. Uh, federal government, they've all kind of expanded their power over time. Uh, but one thing we, um, another thing I kind of want to talk about and, and, and think about a little bit is uh, federal versus uh, state constitutions. And I know Didi might get into this a little bit. Uh, but so far we've been talking about the federal constitution. If you take a constitutional law class, uh, if you learn about the constitution, you know, in high school, college, or even in law school, most of the conversation is about the federal constitution, you know, what we've been talking about so far. But each of the 50 states also have constitutions. Um, and they're, you know, set up in parallel ways to the federal constitution, the three branches of government. Uh, but there are some different characteristics in uh, state constitutions and state government, uh, which um, may affect how we want to think about uh, some of these issues, about separation of uh, powers. So I noted that uh, Congress, federal government, has limited powers. They are enumerated. Article one of the Constitution lists out what Congress can do. And as I said, regulating interstate commerce, uh, you know, levying taxes, uh, uh, spending, uh, limited powers. State legislatures, on the other hand, typically have plenary powers. They can legislate, pass laws about a whole variety of matters that you know, aren't uh, necessarily listed in these state constitutions. So state legislatures have a, a broader range of powers. Uh, state judges, you may know, are uh, elected in many states, in the majority of states. That's not true of the federal judi judi judiciary. Uh, president appoints federal judges and their lifetime appointments. State judges can be uh, elected out of office, uh, you know, and it varies in different states how that happens. You know, sometimes they're initially appointed by the governor and then uh, uh, sit for re-election. Um, so uh, differences uh, in the state and federal governments, and that has, uh, you know, some implications also. Uh, you know, state judiciaries, I mean, if, if judges are politically accountable, if they are going to go for election, that may affect how they view different issues, uh, how they rule on cases. Uh, and it also provides another check, you know, uh, Jen mentioned checks and balances. So federal judges are appointed for life. Uh, once they're in office, unless they are impeached, uh, they can make decisions without having to worry about the voters. You know, they can go kind of against, against the grain. State judges uh, will have to worry about re-election in, in most states. Uh, so there's a kind of political accountability. Uh, you can view that as a, as a negative. I mean, that means, uh, you know, they're susceptible to political pressures. But also, if they're doing things that are unpopular, they can be voted uh, out of office. Uh, so uh, kind of a, a different uh, balance of powers there. And one can make the argument also that, you know, state judges, uh, you know, you think about judicial activism. Should judges take a broader role in, in striking down acts of the legislature? Well, for a state judge, you know, if they do something that the people don't like, uh, they can be voted out of office. Uh, so, you know, should that make a difference in terms of how state judges exercise their power? Uh, another difference between the federal and state uh, uh, constitutions, federal constitution is relatively hard to amend. Um, and I won't go through the whole process of how that's done, but it takes, you know, it takes a lot. It takes uh, three-fourths of the state ratifying any amendment, and before that, you know, you, uh, uh, Congress has to do some things. Uh, state constitutions, most states are more easily amended. They can be amended by popular referendum. And that whole process varies state to state also. But you see on a ballot, uh, you know, in a typical election, you may see uh, several different proposed amendments to state constitutions. Uh, so how do we think about that? Uh, well, again, you know, if, if uh, state judges, say state Supreme Court, makes a ruling that the people don't like, number one, you know, if they're uh, up for office, you can vote them out. Number two, uh, you can get a ballot measure uh, on, on the ballot. It may be a way to change a state uh, Supreme Court ruling. So does that mean, you know, state courts should exercise more power than, say, the, the federal courts? Is there there's more checks and balances there? Those are all the types of issues that are debated uh, in, in constitutional law. Uh, so, you know, with that conversation, I think I'll pass it over to Dee Dee. I'll talk about a balance of power and separation of powers, which is basically the same uh, at the state level as it is at the federal level, with certain exceptions, as you said, enumerated powers uh, versus plenary powers. Is that, was, was that the term you used? Yeah. But I just want to get real for a minute here and uh, say that we're, we're having this discussion um, at, a, at a really fragile time in our democracy. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a time when, you know, 69% of Democrats and 69% of Republicans 
uh, feel that democracy is in danger of collapse. Now, they feel that way for different reasons, uh, but still, um, when there is such a distrust of institutions, uh, whether it be the judiciary or whether it be the uh, Congress or the legislature or the, or the, um, or the president or the governor, um, that kind of changes the conversation. Um, and we used to you know, be able to rely on civics classes. Somebody mentioned civics classes here. Well, you know, we, we don't have civics classes uh, very often in, uh, in our school system now. So thank you to the New Mexico Humanities Council for filling in this gap and trying to uh, translate uh, some of our precious uh, heritage uh, to ordinary people. Now, talking about balance of power um, and the inherent tension between the three branches of, of government, um, the executive, the legislative, and the courts, or the judiciary, um, the, the underlying question is, is it working? Is this inherent tension between the three branches of government, is it working uh, to preserve democracy? Um, or is there something out of whack here? Uh, does when one branch has more power than the other, uh, or when two branches are captured by one political party, not even mentioned in the uh, Constitution? Let's, let's try to approach that question, I think. Um, but remember, you know, according to the Annenberg Center, um, one in four Americans do not know um, what the judiciary is, what the, uh, what the um, executive is, and what the uh, legislature is. So they, don't, they can't name any branch of government or, or identify what the branches are supposed to be doing. So I think it's time to really kind of go back to the basics and um, you know, make sure that everyone knows what the legislature is supposed to be doing in terms of making laws, constructing a budget, what the executive does in terms of carrying out the laws, executing um, and administering the laws that are passed by the legislature or by Congress, and the what the courts are supposed to be doing in terms of um, you know, solving disputes between the various branches and applying the Constitution to specific instances. Um, people don't know that. I mean, people uh, are out demonstrating uh, at the Supreme Court in the uh, wake of the Dobbs decision as if those folks were elected officials. Um, and could be, uh, could be replaced uh, at the next election. <laughs> so um, I think there's a great deal of confusion. But um, just, just back to New Mexico and my own stories um, or experience about this question, um, does this balance of power system work or is there something out of whack? Um, so I've had a couple of different experiences, and I'll just start with the present day and the, um, and the coronavirus. When our governor ex uh, assumed extraordinary powers to, in a public health emergency to save lives, um, and she, um, and she uh, banned certain meetings, she required masks to be worn in certain uh, uh, instances, and uh, closed certain uh, casinos and restaurants and, uh, and, other, and, and schools and universities. And that ordinarily would be seen as the executive really assuming the reins and uh, the other two branches be damned. Uh, but what, what, what the backstory to that is that the governor was acting under a law that was passed by the legislature. Uh, it was the Public Health Emergency Act, and I know something about it because I was the author of it uh, in, in 2003. It was passed 
to give the governor such powers. Remember, that was in the wake of 9-11. Um, and anthrax, and it was specifically passed um, to um, allow these extraordinary powers. Um, but they were extraordinary. And uh, there were those who objected to those uh, limitations on individual freedom. And uh, she was taken to court several times by the Restaurant Association, by the Republican Party, and each time, the New Mexico Supreme Court said um, she was within her powers because the, the um, legislation had been crafted in such a way that um, her powers were not absolute, uh, but they were temporary. And if she wanted to, um, to, to, uh, to constrain individual liberty in that way, uh, she could do it. But only for, I think it was six months, uh, or maybe even shorter period. And then she had to renew that again, uh, which she did over 10 times, I think. That, that was kind of a balance. Uh, and the courts, uh, the courts said that she was within her powers. The legislature, there were certain members of the legislature that were not happy about that. And um, I think it was not this year, but the previous year, there was a move uh, to uh, have the legislature limit the time further uh, when a governor could, um, could declare a public health emergency. Um, it didn't go anywhere in the legislature. Um, now, some of that had uh, to do with the fact that it was a Democratic governor and a, and a Democratic um, legislature. Um, but that's not always the case. You know, uh, quite often in New Mexico, uh, in fact, only once since the 1950s have we had a Republican-controlled legislature. Um, and it's almost all the, other all the other times have been controlled by the Democrats. But we've had Republican governors, too. And so um, just, to, um, just to rewind a little bit uh, further uh, to, the, to the governorship of Susana Martinez, that was, a, that was a, I think, a case in point uh, where we could see the legislature trying to check the governor, the Democratic legislature trying to check the governor using this separation of powers. And, and when, the, when the legislature does that, it has several tools put down in the Constitution where it can do that. One is it in the Senate, where I served, uh, it can confirm uh, the governor's uh, cabinet secretaries or not. Cabinet secretaries are integral to executing the law, to uh, running individual departments. And the Senate must confirm the, um, the appointments of the governor in order for that to happen. Um, the legislature can oversee the various departments and of course controls the purse strings, uh, which is the ultimate control. And um, it can also impeach um, members of the executive uh, if they have uh, uh, broken their law or their oath of office. In the first instance, um, the New Mexico legislature did not confirm uh, one of Susana Martinez's uh, appointments, and that was the education nominee, Hannah Scandera. Some of you may remember Hannah Scandera. She was an acolyte of Jeb Bush, uh, Governor Jeb Bush in Florida, uh, had a very uh, strong ideas about education and charter schools and um, was hated by the teachers' unions. And the New Mexico legislature, the New Mexico Senate, um, did something that I had not seen before, and that was they didn't reject the, um, they didn't reject the secretary's nomination, but they just didn't hear, she did, they just didn't hear the nomination for, I think, four years. And she was never confirmed. She, that didn't mean she didn't serve. She just served as an acting secretary. Uh, but that really kind of undercut the governor's ability 
to make policy in the education arena. And the upshot of that, some folks feel, was the, the suit that was later brought, the um, uh, Martinez Yazi suit, um, uh, which uh, was uh, influenced the spending of money by the legislature and also um, the policy um, of the executive. So the other uh, case, even further in the past, was in uh, 2005, when the legislature um, actually, uh, the House, convened an impeachment committee to, um, to deal with a scandal on the part of the treasurer in New Mexico, uh, Robert V. Hill. Some of you may remember that. Um, it was, you know, in New Mexico, we have several different executives, not just the governor. We also have independent executives in the treasurer and the assessor and the uh, attorney general. So um, this, this particular problem was uh, one of embezzlement, uh, corruption, and um, there was a, a period there where um, the, the uh, the legislature was going to have to address this by impeachment, and which which was new to me. I had never been through that, and it's very rare. Um, but there was a committee convened in the House, and uh, the uh, preparations were made. Uh, but finally, after that pressure was brought to bear on him, he resigned, um, and uh, later on served time. Uh, in the, I think it was the federal penitentiary, uh, for his um, for his misdeeds, that that was, I think, a situation where the system worked, uh, a balance of powers worked. I think the situation where the education uh, secretary was not confirmed was was created dysfunction uh, within the government uh, by. Um, by the fact that the um, legislature would not, would not confirm that appointment. Now, how can the executive then uh, constrain the legislature? Let's talk about that, uh, because you know, it goes both ways. And um, of course, the, the most common way is through the veto, uh, through the veto uh, of um, budgetary matters, and regular bills. And in New Mexico, the governor has a line item veto. So uh, the governor can uh, X out certain appropriations. There have been several law cases, uh, again against uh, Susana Martinez, in which the governor tried to write in, in just not just crossing out, but writing in uh, appropriations. And that was uh, struck down. But the king of the vetoes in New Mexico, of course, was Gary Johnson. And uh, Gary Johnson was very proud of the number of vetoes that he cast. It was much like a sporting event uh, to him. Uh, and the, my first year in the uh, New Mexico legislature, there was an extraordinary event that happened. I didn't know how extraordinary it was when I was there. Governor Johnson uh, veto had you know, had no limit. I mean, he would veto budgets two and three times, causing a special session after special session um, because we, we couldn't go on without a budget. Um, although he at points seemed to think that that was within his power just to continue on uh, after the end of the fiscal year. But um, in my first year there, um, it, which was 1997, was some of you, some of you may remember the era of Clinton's uh, welfare reform. Remember, Clinton, uh, Clinton was doing welfare reform. It was he was a middle of the road Democrat, and um, he had his. I forgot what his uh, welfare reform was. Required work uh, for the first time uh, for welfare, and uh, so uh, Johnson had a similar but even more draconian program that he put in place. And then the legislature came into session in 1997 and said, mm -mm, we don't like that. Um, we we want to do our version of, of welfare reform. And so we passed a bill 
um, which was less draconian, I would say, than I think it was called New Mexico Progress. And we passed it, and the governor vetoed it, and which we expect, which we came to expect after a while, and uh, he vetoed it. But then he put into effect again his own plan, and so the New Mexico legislature sued the governor. Uh, it sued the governor. And the Health and Human Services Committee, which I was on at the time, was, was in the lead on this. J. Paul Taylor, who was a representative from, uh, from Las Cruces, uh, was the named plaintiff. And then there were several others. They heard it right away. The, um, the Supreme Court of New Mexico heard it right away and struck down the governor's uh, plan for welfare reform. And then the governor said, no, I'm going to put my own plan into effect anyway. And so um, then the uh, New Mexico legislature went back into court and the governor of New Mexico was held in contempt. Um, it was in December of uh, 1997. And then at that point, uh, the legislature's plan, which w the veto had been overridden, and uh, that was put into effect. But um, one thing that strikes me, and I'd be interested to hear what the professors say, is that there's a, there was a tremendous amount of negotiations between uh, the legislative branch and the executive branch. Uh, these these uh, vetoes and these suits were a way that they negotiated to get a policy that would be put into effect for the next year or a budget for the next year. Um, and I, I don't know really is if there is that much of negotiation used in uh, court action. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that is, um, that's a part of it, but uh, it seems a little bit more definitive to me. So thanks for listening to us, and uh, we, we hope that we can trust our moderator to, to take, us, take us home. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, New Mexico Humanities Council. We appreciate you.